Let's start from Psalm 23, verse 1, New King James Version. All of us are going to read together. Psalm 23, verse 1. Are you ready? Let's go. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that if there is anyone struggling with lack, anyone in need of material provisions, Today will mark the end of lack in the name of Jesus Christ. If anyone has a sickness on their body, the power that raised Christ from death destroys that sickness now. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so last week we began this discussion and we were discussing about how to destroy money worries. <laughs> See, if you know anything about money, you will know the starting point is your attitude. In fact, I should say this, worrying will not solve your money problems. Worrying will create new problems. If I worry has a way of driving the money away from you, okay? So uh, I just want to encourage, please go on our YouTube page and watch the messages so far on the Trusting God for Your Finances series. So that's the title of today's message. This is Trusting God for Your Finances, number two. It so happened that during the week, somebody asked me on Twitter, um, can someone of your status really, is it not easy for someone of your status to say that we should not worry about money? Okay? And, uh, you know, do you realize that it is very difficult for people uh, with the level of hunger, and the person put in bracket, sakma, in the country. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> sakma, or sapa. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not sure of the correct pronunciation, but it was on social media. Actually, I was watching a comedy <laughs> by one of our comedians, Kiki, and somebody there was trying to call sakma with... Uh, this European tonation, you know, the person said, Sapa. <laughs> Sapa? Sapa. <laughs> Listen, there is no way you're going to give a beautiful name to hunger. Hunger is hunger, okay? So, uh, and I see people ask often on social media, Sapa na your mates. <laughs> you know, when hunger kicks in, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> You can't discuss anything else until it is resolved, right? Good. So, but of course, <laughs> many of you know my story. <laughs> uh, uh, today is not a day for telling those long stories. Oh, yeah, but if it is about uh, um, living in a house, you, you know, your parents are struggling to pay rent, it's not easy to come by food, my mom had to go buy food stuff on credit, I've been there or not having toothbrush to put on my brush and all of that. I've been there, I've been there, but we're here now, okay? <laughs> we're here now. And I just want to say to someone, please pay attention, especially if you're a young person, please pay attention, okay? Please pay attention, because I feel like I, I, I have a special assignment on this and I'm very passionate about it, okay? we can solve the poverty problem. Amen. <laughs> All right. But this is the most important thing I want to draw from that experience. When you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must value his words more than you value your circumstances. Whatever it is you're going through, if you ever 
consider the facts or the reality of your circumstances to be more important than what Jesus Christ has said, you missed the miracle. You missed the change. You missed the opportunity for a transformation in your life. So it's good we get that foundation in place. Amen? Good. So don't forget what we said last week. Never value money more than you value God. Many people don't know they are money worshippers. And when you say somebody is a money worshipper, some people will think, oh, it's rich people that are in that category. Oh, no. A lot of poor people are money worshippers. Once you use money to determine your value, for example, the availability or non-availability of it, you're in trouble. You're into materialism. Okay? You are infinitely more valuable than anything on this planet, any amount of money on this planet. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you would have read where he said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? <clears throat> okay? <laughs> so, one human soul is worth more than all of the material resources you have on this planet. One. Number two, you never let the presence or absence of money determine your peace and joy. That's important. We said that last week, and I want to reemphasize that. Never let the presence or absence of money determine your joy. Let the presence of God determine your peace and joy. Do you remember what uh, David, the psalmist said in Psalm 23? Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall do what? I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. So it's the presence of God that matters. Do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Yes, it's the valley of the shadow of death, but it's not the valley of death. It's the shadow. It's the shadow. If poverty is threatening to harass you, it's just a shadow. <laughs> Don't take your eyes off God. Amen. <laughs> That's it. The fear comes in when we take our eyes off God. Keep your focus on God. Let the presence of God determine your joy. Then whether money is present or it is absent, it will not matter. You will be happy all the time. Amen. Good, good, good. Okay, so just some brief um, intro introduction there. <laughs> three quick things today. Three quick things. Three quick things. Number one, center your thinking on the finished work of Christ. If you're trusting God with your finances or for your finances, you must learn to center your thinking on the finished work of Christ. We Christians believe, according to the Bible, that it was when sin came into the world that poverty came. I read Genesis 3, 17 to 19, New Living Translation. Genesis 3, 17 to 19. And to the man, he said, that is God speaking. Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. And your life, all your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and teasels for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Okay, so we believe that's where the curse came, struggling, sweating to eat. We also believe as Christians that that is the reason why God sent Jesus Christ into the world and that he died for our sins. He paid the price for our sins and that payment has been credited into our accounts. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, New Living Translation. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's it. So a work of substitution happened when Jesus Christ went to the cross and died that shameful and horrible death. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. And Jesus paid on our behalf, right? Good. So Jesus Christ took our place so that we can take his place. God made him who did not know any sin to become sin for us. Not just a sinner, 
He became sin personified so that we can take his place. And now today, we are right with God. It's too beautiful for some people to understand, right? <laughs> oh, yes. At the moment you ask God to remember the price that Jesus Christ paid, and you ask him to forgive you your sins, that he wipes your slate clean, wipes your record clean, and now sees you as someone who has never committed a sin. Too wonderful for people to believe, but that's the truth. That's what we Christians believe. That is what the word of God says. Amen. <laughs> Woo. So, now that the same problem has been solved, the consequences for sin have also been resolved. The poverty problem was solved when the sin problem was solved. That's what I'm trying to say. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, New Living Translation. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you, he could make you rich. That's it. The work of substitution. Can you see that? <laughs> so he was rich, right? We were poor. It was on the cross that he became poor. It was on the cross when he carried our sins. He carried all the consequences for sin. On the cross, that's how the Bible says also that he carried all our sicknesses and diseases on him while he was there. So <laughs> now that we are taking his place, we have no poverty anymore because Jesus carried everything. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. This is beautiful. If you are a Christian, you are not poor, not in capital. If you are a Christian, you are not poor. Jesus carried your poverty on the cross. You see, in this passage of scripture, uh, um, Paul the Apostle was actually speaking about the generosity of a particular church. And then he just branched, made this statement. So we pull it out because that statement in itself is powerful. Jesus Christ was rich. You were poor. On the cross, he took the poverty. There's no poverty left for you to carry. As a Christian, your starting point is not poverty. You are not a poor person struggling to become rich. You are rich already. Ooh. <laughs> That's so beautiful. You know what I want you to do with what I just said? All through this week, meditate on it. When you get home, roll it over and over. Perhaps go, go back on our website or on YouTube, you know, on social media and listen to it. Listen to it again and again and again. Listen to it again and again. Let it sink in. Let it sink into your consciousness to the point where you now tell yourself, that's it. I am not poor. I am rich. I am not poor. Jesus took the poverty. My label has changed. My title has changed. Hallelujah. This is important because what you believe determines who you become. Shake off those dangerous labels that society may have placed on you. Anything that does not agree with the word of God, throw it away. Who will you believe? Yes, uh, uh, I know for the sake of order, for the sake of structure, okay? We have divisions in the society. We have categories. We have labels. But honestly, anything that does not agree with the word of God, you have to bury it. Believe what God says. You are who God says you are, okay? You may have accepted the label, common man. You may have accepted the label, masses. You know, throw them away. <laughs> I am not poor. I am not common. I'm not the masses. <laughs> I believe what God says about me. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. You know the interesting thing? The major difference between the rich and the poor is how they think. That's it. It's their thinking. The rich believe that they are rich. The poor believe that they are poor. <laughs> it, 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 you, it sounds simple, but it is powerful. You've got to make that shift. It took time for me to get it, but eventually I got it. Because one day I, I bought a book with all the money I had on me, the title, Think and Grow Rich, 
by Napoleon Hill. You, you, honestly, it was while I was reading the book. I don't agree with everything written in the book, but it was while I was reading the, reading the book that I got to understand the Bible. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans 12, 2. New Living Translation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Can you imagine that? That's it. Let God transform you by changing what? The way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See? You won't realize your potential or your destiny without changing your thinking. A man uh, named James Allen said, you cannot travel within and stand still without. <laughs> you can't change on the inside and not change on the outside. It's a law. Your outside must always change to conform to your inside. So you know what I made up my mind to do? To continue to travel on the inside. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Lord Jesus. So please say this after me. Say this after me. In Christ, my sins are forgiven. I am free from poverty for the rest of my life. I am rich for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, say a powerful amen. Oh, someone just become a millionaire <laughs> right there. Someone just become a billionaire right there. That's where you make the shift. Somebody just crossed the line. Thank you, Jesus. No, 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 this is not theory. It's happened, happened in my life, happened in so many lives here, over and over and over. If it's your first time of hearing this kind of a thing, it's your turn. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Shake hands with someone. If somebody's close to you, tell them, welcome to the club. Hallelujah. Okay, let's move on. I said three quick things. Number two, get divine direction. If you are trusting God for your finances, trust God to speak to you, to tell you what to do. Get divine direction. Your greatest asset is the voice of the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. Your greatest asset, therefore, for not lacking, is knowing and hearing and following the voice of the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's it. He restores my soul. Okay? Then remember, yes, uh, uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's for all from Psalm 23. Do I walk? Okay, no, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's all good when you are following the voice of the shepherd. John chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Jesus speaking, New Living Translation. John 10, 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Isn't that powerful? I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Back to the first point, the finished work of Christ. Now the connecting point, the voice of the shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, they know me. John 10, 27. John 10, 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Wow. Listen. Develop the capacity to hear God. It's your greatest single asset on this planet. Develop the capacity to hear God. It's a responsibility you should not delegate as a Christian. Okay, before Christ came, yes, they had to depend on prophets. They had to depend on other people to hear from God. Come, depend on Moses tell them to tell them what God was saying. Right now, the Spirit of God is inside you. The God that speaks to the pastor is inside you. Develop the capacity to hear God. Everything else depends on that. Your shepherd knows where the green grass is. Your shepherd 
knows where the water is. One instruction from God can change your financial situation. Hallelujah. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that in the next seven days, that instruction will come to you. You will take a simple step, send an email, make a phone call, visit somebody, submit a proposal in obedience to an inspired thought put in your heart by God, you will get a breakthrough. If you believe that, say a powerful amen. <laughs> All right. In the worst of times in the Bible, the Orient Famine, 1 Kings 17, God's instruction guaranteed provision for Elijah, the prophet. There was famine, no food anywhere. And God said to Elijah, go by the brook Cherith. Go stay there. I have commanded ravens, birds, to feed you there. The Bible says he went there and birds brought bread to him every day and he drank from the water of the brook. After some time, they said the water dried up. Then God said to him, move to Zarephath. I have commanded a widow to feed you there. There's a place called there. <laughs> and whatever is holding your provision, whoever is holding your provision is actually under a divine command to make provisions for you. Heaven will move you there in the name of Jesus Christ. It was a bad day for business in Luke chapter 5. The fishermen tried all night, caught nothing. And Jesus showed up on the shores in the morning. Moved towards the gentleman called Peter. Loaned his boat, preached from it. When he was done, he turned to Peter and gave him an instruction. Luke 5, 4 to 6. Luke 5, 4 to 6. New Living Translation. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. Wow. <laughs> One instruction from Jesus Christ. Submission to that instruction was what saved Peter. He did not see Jesus as a carpenter interfering in the fishing business. He said, nevertheless, since you said it, I'm going to do it. When he did, fish rushed in, in the very place where they tried and caught nothing. I see major shifts happening this week. I said, I see major shifts happening in this week. The very place where you struggled, you're going to laugh. You're going to rejoice in the name of Jesus Christ. One instruction from God will change the situation. I know. Uh, I mean... <laughs> One of us shared this story many years ago. He was just starting business, needed 20 million naira, okay, to buy some property, had no clue where to get the money from, and he was right inside the service. And he said, while I was teaching, under inspiration, he said the divine idea just came to him, the names of four people, and that he should loan 5 million naira from each of them. Right after the service, he stepped outside, just outside the hall, picked his phone, called the first one, the man agreed, the second, the third, the fourth. His 20 million era was complete. Was able to do the transaction, give them their money back. It can be as simple as that. So inspiration is the key to revelation. Don't miss that. Job 32 verse 8, there's a spirit in man. The inspiration of the Almighty gives him understanding. When you attend the service, don't miss it. It could be during the singing, you know, it could be during the message, but it's an atmosphere of inspiration. On your own also, when you listen to music, when you listen to somebody preaching, when you're reading the Bible on your own, while you're praying, it's inspiration. Inspiration puts you on God's frequency. When you are there, you hear. Somebody says, how do I hear from God? Let me make it simple, okay? You may get our past messages on divine direction, but let me make it very simple. Communication, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Communication, hearing from God is communication. So think of your TV, your radio, think of your phone, think of the internet. It's about the transmission of images and words, images and words. So pay attention while you pray, while you're under inspiration, pay attention to the words and the images coming into your heart and mind. The spontaneous ones are likely to be from God, from the Holy Spirit, okay? Good. Fantastic. So, the last one. <laughs> Three quick things, remember. The last one. 
sell something. Sell some. What did I say? Sell something. Why am I adding that? <laughs> it's easy for Christians to be deceived and to miss it, you know, uh, uh, because, yes, God works miracles. God provides miraculously. But that is the exception rather than the rule. He walks through the principle of exchange of value. That's how it works. That's, that's how money works, isn't it? Money is a means for exchange of value. Anybody should know that. If value goes from you, value will come back to you. Okay? So I, I don't want you to be confused by uh, the testimonies we share, we pastors share. That's important, right? Because we tell you, oh, like, I have loads of them, right? <laughs> okay, so I was on the flight, and a gentleman walked up to me and gave me an envelope, okay? It was money that was in there. I've gotten quite a number of <laughs> checks like that or cash on flights. Or somebody gave me this, gave me a car, or different things like that. So when you hear that, okay, I, I know, I know. What people want is a scenario where, oh, just because you did, you gave in church or you gave somebody, okay, so God gives you money that you did not work for. So that's the reason why many Christians are still poor. Because it doesn't work like that. Value needs to go from you, then value will come back to you. Hmm? So the one for pastors, it's there. If you see a pastor share a testimony like that, value went from the pastor too. It's in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. Jesus, they listed some people there, some ladies. Jesus cast out devils from some. He healed some. He brought deliverance to some. Then the Bible says that they gave to him from his substance to support his ministry. There was still a value exchange. People assume that it's every church that has money. Oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Except if you have a way of cheating people of their money. It doesn't work like that. Value is got to go from you. Value comes back. Now, outside of preaching. What's the normal way? You have a product. You have a product to sell. So in 2 Kings chapter 4, a lady ran to the prophet Elisha like that. Okay? Because creditors wanted to take her children to become slaves. And then the prophet told her, oh, what do you have in the house? She said, nothing. Just a small jar of oil. And he said, that small jar of oil is enough. It's enough. Go and borrow large barrels, empty barrels, right? Then take from the small jar. It doesn't make sense, but I'm going to teach you something, how it works in God's system. Take from the small jar, pour it into those large barrels. The moment she started, there was a miracle flow. When she was done, he told her to sell the oil and then use the money to pay off her debt. It's amazing that even though God would work a miracle in her life, it will still have to do with selling something. God created something for her to sell. Notice it started with the little bit in her house. Nobody will ever get to the point where there is nothing God can, move, can use to move you like that to the point of breakthrough. But you have to be willing to acquire skills, to develop expertise, to have products, to have services to sell. This is important. When I was asking God many years ago, how do we solve the poverty problem? He showed me from the Bible. Abraham was a businessman. Isaac was an entrepreneur. Jacob was an entrepreneur. Even Jesus up to the age of 30 was a businessman. That for me just it was boom. And we began to teach entrepreneurship. I was teaching Sunday morning for some two, three years. How to start and run a business from the Bible. <laughs> okay, We are approaching from a practical way here. Right? So I just wanted to say to someone, get ready. Get ready. I'm only scratching this. Because of time, I'm not going to go into it. We'll continue next time. Okay? I needed to provide that balance. Because God is about to blow somebody's mind. One instruction from God is going to change your story. This week, in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so remember, center your thinking on the finished work of Christ. Make sure you get divine direction from God. And finally, make sure you are selling something. I prophesy on you in the name of Jesus. God has broken the hold of poverty on the lives of many people here. It's your turn. I said it's your turn. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, in the next seven days, I pray for the heavens to be opened over you, for your eyes to be opened, 
for your ears to be opened, for you to get an instruction from God. What seemed complex before financially, the solution will come to you easy. You act on it, you will get more than enough. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Let it be according to your word in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Give us powerful testimonies, amazing testimonies. If anyone has been under a curse because of poverty that can be transgenerational sometimes, I declare now that curse is destroyed. In the name of Jesus, I release the power of blessing on everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. Day Star, Raising Role Models.